Welcome to this week in review. Tonight's stories include Breakfast with Santa, Burgio Academy Christmas Concert, Interview with Angela Randall, Burgio Academy Awards Night, These Stories plus the BBS Playbill, and more coming up after this. The grade two, three class wish you a safe and wonderful Christmas. Christmas safety tips. When loading up for Christmas, use only CSA approved lights. Use the proper lights for the environment. Indoor lights should not be used outdoors because they lack the weatherproof connection. Outdoor lights burn too hot and should not be used indoors. Replace immediately any bulbs that do not light because the other bulbs that are operating might overheat. If you must use ex extension cords and wall outlets, use only the number of connections for which the outlet is designed. Failure to do this can cause overheating. On Sunday, December the 18th, the Burgio Fire Department and the Burnets held their annual breakfast with Santa. When we dropped by the fire hall for the first time, there was a fine crowd. Before we left, business was picking up even more. By 10.30 a.m., the fire department was getting very busy serving their guests. From then until 1 p.m., there was a steady flow of customers. Breakfast with Santa is fast becoming one of the most popular activities for the Christmas season. Not only do you get to have breakfast with Santa, you get to see many friends that are visiting for Christmas, and the best part is that you can experience Christmas through the eyes of children. The children enjoyed having Santa there while they ate breakfast. Santa greeted everyone and handed out candy canes to all the children. He had his picture taken with many of them. He was having a great time. An event like this takes quite a bit of work. 
The firefighters and Burnett's have breakfast with Santa down to a science. Everything runs smoothly. They are becoming very experienced with waiting on tables. The kitchen was a bustle of activity. Deputy Fire Chief Lloyd James was busy filling orders. Bud Green was busy cooking up sausages and keeping them warm. Clayt Mead and Guy Ann must have been naughty because they were doing all the dishes. Mitchell Billard was busy flipping pancakes and Ted Anderson was making toasts. Jim Hare and Bruce Green also must have been caught being naughty. They too were up to their elbows in dishes. This year on the menu was toast, bologna, sausages, pancakes, tea, coffee, milk and juice. It was a very enjoyable breakfast and the best part was that you could walk away from the dishes. Congratulations to the fire department and the Burnett's on another successful breakfast with Santa. On Monday night, Virgil Academy held their annual Christmas concert. Here are a few highlights. The concert will be shown in its entirety on Tuesday, January the 3rd. On Tuesday of this week, we had an interview with Angela Randall with Randall Travel. We have with us in our studio today, Angie Randall with Randall Travel. Welcome, Angie. Thank you. Now, you've been uh, advertising with our company now for two to three months, for sure. And you have a lot of information on your ad. And now you were telling us that there seems to be some confusion about the pricing on your ad. So you want to explain it a little bit more to us? Um, yeah. Um, okay. If I send the pricing in to you on a Saturday, I'll do the price list up on a Friday. Um, these prices obviously can sell out or change at any point of time. So if you were to call me, I would then go on and re recheck the pricing and give you the best price at that time. Um, I know a lot of people think that when they are calling me or, or using a travel agency of any kind, that they would pay an extra fee, but they don't. What you see on TV, on, on my ad, or what I tell you is the price now, is actually the same price that you would find yourself if you were to go online and look yourself. Okay, so there's no really no hidden cost? There's no hidden cost. Okay, no. okay. <laughs> it could be confusing, I it guess. It could be, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, of course, you're in the travel agency business, mm -hmm. and from your perspective, why do you think it would be uh, more of benefit to travelers to use an agency rather than to book the, line, the, the airline ticket online themselves. For example, if I, were, if I was going to go visit my children mm -hmm. and I was, well, I've done it, I've just mm -hmm. booked online, why would it be easier for me or more beneficial to me to book through you or any agency for that matter mm -hmm. than go online? 
Um, the first one is protection. Okay. Um, plain and simple, as a travel agent, I possibly book 100 tickets in a month, maybe, you know. Um, as an individual person, you may book five, one, two, a year. Um, so if something was to happen or uh, you were to be snowed in, you were to have a problem, there was a flight delay, I have a better chance of getting something resolved um, faster from the airline than an individual person would. I have what's called buying power with the okay. airline. So um, if you were to go on a book by yourself, you'd be just a standalone individual. They don't track it. They don't see it. I mean, they know you're a client. They know you're a passenger, but that's all they know. Okay. Um, they do track travel agents, and for each booking is a point. And those points, I guess, um, show the, the buying power that I have with okay. them. Okay. Uh, let's use an example. Mm -hmm. um, I'm booking a flight from Deer Lake to Calgary. Mm -hmm. um, I get to Halifax and there's a big snowstorm and I booked the ticket myself. What kind of trouble am I in right now? You'd have to basically wait in the airport in the lines just like everyone else um, or call Air Canada and wait on hold which I've done <laughs> a lot of times um, and basically find the information yourself, go through it yourself. Um, pay for your own change fees, pay for your own hotel fees, pay for your own food, your own transportation, because that would be considered um, a, a problem or a delay that the airport or the airline themselves did not cause. Okay. So it's natural causes, right? Um, if you book through a travel agency, the benefit is I would do all the waiting, the holding, the legwork for you, switching you around, getting you on the next available flight, if at any cost, a minimal cost. Um, I would also, before you travel, that would be a perfect reason why you should purchase travel insurance. Um, it doesn't just protect you for luggage, it protects you for things such as weather delays. Uh, your travel insurance would then kick in and pay for you to have a hotel. They would pay for your change fees, they would pay for your food, they would pay for um, any amenities you need while you're there because your luggage would most likely be checked in if you're going from Deer Lake through. Um, they would pay for you to pick up $250 worth of things you may need, like a nighty toothbrush, shampoo. It sounds small, but it's really expensive when you have to pay for it yourself, right? Sure. And they would pay for all of that. And that would be obviously, too, a very con uh, a convenient thing for you to do if you're stuck somewhere for a day or a day and two with nothing. Exactly. Um, cost for insurance now. Mm -hmm. Would that be, when you book tickets, do you say, would you like insurance? And is that that's a cost that the, the customer would know up front, obviously. They would know it up front. Okay. Um, it is extra on top of their airline ticket, yes. obviously. Um, and it varies depending on age group, length of stay, um, price of your original ticket. Usually what I find for people that are, are traveling, if they're only traveling for short periods of time, it's, it's usually somewhere around $80 on a $700 oh. ticket, something okay. minimal. It's, it's not overly no, expensive. No, no. It's it's very reasonable. I was thinking reasonable. you were going to say like $200 or something <laughs> no. like that. No. Yeah, no, it's very reasonable. And um, it's it's one of those things that I guess it's like car insurance or home insurance. You know, if your house never burns down or you never get in an accident, you kind of think to yourself, well, why am I spending all this money? But the one time you need it is the one time it really helps. Things like the blizzards that happen in Halifax um, or even Burjo Road. I mean, how many of us have been stuck here in town thinking, oh my god, I have to go out a day early now, and what if it snows, and all panicked driving in winter weather. Well, if something like that occurs, it's actually, you haven't actually been to the airport yet, but you've already started your travel, so yeah. to speak, so because you're already en route and this happens, it then kicks in and protects you that way as well. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. A lot of information that people probably didn't know. No, they, it's, it's now by law as a travel agent, you have to inform people of these um, different options they have. Sure. And it, I mean, it's something I didn't know until I was in the industry. And I traveled a lot when I was a, a young child, right? And it's a lot that I didn't know until I actually did the course and I was in the industry myself. Um, it protects you even for medical reasons, you know? If you were to get sick, while you were away, they will, depending on how sick you get, right, if it's a major sickness and you need an operation or something and you want to be operated on back home here in Newfoundland, they'll fly you home on a medevac 
uh, flight, if they need to operate there before you travel, they'll fly someone to your bedside. Um, if someone home gets sick and they need to, you need to go home, they'll pay for a ticket for you to cancel your trip early and go home um, to be... So that's all covered under your All insurance? covered under the $80 that you just paid for insurance. Okay. Now that's an approximate cost, but you know, um, if you, if something simple like falling down and breaking your leg, um, they'll pay for uh, your Newfoundland care card. Um, that would actually pay something like $135 towards um, an ambulance if you're away. But an ambulance actually probably costs somewhere closer to $600, right, for an ambulance ride in the city. Now, if you look at the difference, that's quite a bit. If you just paid that $80 for your insurance, well, there you go, that's covered. Okay. You know, they pay for that. They pay for that extra coverage to get you to go to the hospital. And okay. Now, before we, uh, we started our interview, we had a little chat, and you were telling me something very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of people that travel um, twice a year, mm -hmm. I think, maybe three times a year, from this community to go to different parts of um, the mainland for seismic work. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me that if those people got together and booked as a group, mm -hmm. they could probably get their uh, airline tickets cheaper than what they get them now? Yeah, um, it's something that I was thinking about at the beginning, offering out, but I chose not to um, right away just because I wasn't sure of the interest. Um, Corey, my husband, he travels for work as well. And he's with a big group of people that travel, um, not like this community, they're spread across Canada. But it, it's something similar and it's something that um, I offer to them as well. Um, if people here in, in Burjo decided, okay, they were going to Calgary and they knew that they were going somewhere usually January 5th to 10th, mm -hmm. right, uh, for example, then what we could do is I, as an agent representing a group, could go to Air Canada, CanJet, WestJet, and I could say, listen, we have X amount of people that travel two, three times a year, and they would like a better rate than what they see on TV. They, you know, they, they're dedicated to the, this trip. It's for work reasons and it's a benefit. They have to go. Oh, they have to mm -hmm. go, and it's a benefit to the airline, obviously, to have these people fly on their airline as opposed to another airline, right? Sure. Um, and then I would say to them, well, listen, we can't guarantee they're all going to fly on the 5th, but sometime between the 5th and the 10th, they usually fly, so can we get this group um, access to the lower fare and have that fare dedicated to this group so anytime you call, even if the ticket is selling now at $600, you would still maybe get it at $300, you know. Okay. Um, it's something that we could arrange with the airline itself. So they could go to a travel agency and arrange that? They could. If yeah. if we did that, it would be through my travel agency. Yeah. If, if That's um, something that you offer? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, any travel agency, I guess, could offer mm -hmm. it, but it is a lot of work and a lot of late work that goes into it. So if you... If you go to a travel agent to get them to arrange this, it's solely that travel agent that you have to deal with okay. on that point on. Okay. You can't um, have it arranged for you, but then call somebody else. Joe's Travel, okay. yeah, if yeah. Randall Travel actually has it arranged because Joe's Travel has no idea, yeah, okay. and it's um, certain codes and restrictions that get added. Oh, in. okay. Yeah. Now, there was a lot of information you gave us, a lot of uh, things that we uh, we need to be aware of when we travel. If someone watching this. Um, still is a little bit confused and want more information, uh, can they call you? They can call me, 100%. There's no problem. If they book with me or if they don't book with me, they can call me um, anytime. I have no problem with that. Um, also, too, there was one thing I, I forgot to mention, that for the town of Burgio only, and I know some people know I do this, some people weren't aware that I do do this, I allow... The, the people booking with me to use the option of paying cash for their tickets. Um, that way then they don't have to use their credit card and stuff. At that point there is a little bit of an extra charge. Um, it's a $30 extra charge. It's $10 because of the way I actually access the system and it's a $20 charge because of the processing of the cash to okay. the airline. Um, but other than that, and they would know that if they told me they wanted cash as a, okay. an option to pay. So you would tell them that up front? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, thanks very much for dropping in. No problem. And informing us. And uh, 
of course, keep your aids coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And thanks for dropping by. Thank you. Thank you. Burgio Academy held its awards night on Wednesday of this week. Students received their diplomas and awards for the previous year. Here are a few highlights. The awards night will be shown in its entirety. On Next, I'll call in Mr. Parsons. Now, this is a presentation of the trophies that was there to my right. Uh, this is for the highest academic achievement in grades 7 to 12. The names will be engraved on the appropriate plaque displayed on the Wall of Fame in the main corridor. For grade 7, Zachary Collier. For grade 8, Bethany Ann. Grade 9, Shelly James. <laughs> Level 1, Christina Bungie. <laughs> Level 2, Matthew Dominey. Last but not least, level three, Kristen James. <laughs> Let's give these six students a big round of applause. Stay tuned for more of This Week in Review coming up after this. Put plugs into outlets. Poor contact can cause overheating or produce a shock. To avoid possible overheating, do not coil or bunch these cords which is in use and do not run it under a carpet or rug. Don't have decorations that very small children might swallow that look like food or candy. Use only decorations that are flame resistant or not combustible. If you use a freshly cut Christmas tree, make sure that the tree has a high moisture content. Now over to Mayor Reed with the council report. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, last council uh, report for the year 2005. We had a uh, short meeting on uh, Tuesday night. And the business of council, well, the water treatment plant. That's, there's ongoing progress with the water treatment plant. The uh, phase one, phase one of the repairs are completed. And the ozonation part of the plant that was uh, destroyed, uh, neither insurance company has stepped to the plate yet to acknowledge that they will be financially responsible for that. The lawyer said that by mid-January, all of the airings and the pleads will be uh, taken care of. So it is progressing. Second item is that the, um, the council gave all active firemen on our uh, volunteer fire department, we gave them all a uh, turkey for Christmas. Just a slight token of appreciation of the uh, wonderful job that these people do. Council submitted a budget and it was accepted last night. It will be forward on to uh, the government by the end of December. The budget was a balanced budget. The amount was $923,110. We are 
in the black, I should say. We haven't spent all of our money. Uh, the town is in, uh, I guess you would call it, a uh, fair shape. It, uh, there will be no tax increase uh, in 2006. And I'll repeat that, no tax increase for 2006. And it seems that we, uh, we're doing very well with our collecting of our taxes. And of course, we're doing very well with spending it. It was a balanced budget. Council also applied to government to try to get a ferry terminal out at the wharf there so that the two, three ferries that come to Burjo every week, the passengers who are left somewhere to go to uh, while they're waiting for the ferry to come in. So we applied to government uh, to try to get a, a ferry terminal there. We also applied to government, government for the driver examiner to come to Burjo at least once every two weeks, if at, a, if at all possible, during their, during their new fiscal year. We requested it before, and they said they would look at it again when they did up their new budget. Well, I would assume that they're doing up their new budget in January, so we've uh, sent out a reminder to them to try to get that dry rig examiner to come to Burjo again at least once a month in the new year. There was very little business uh, on Tuesday night, but uh, so I'm going to end the uh, news by uh, by saying, uh, by just uh, telling you something that has got nothing to do with council news, but it's just got something to do with uh, uh, our uh, young people of Burjo. Uh, so I want, I want to give congratulations to Stacy McDonald. Stacy McDonald was admitted to the bar uh, this past week. Uh, he is now a lawyer. And from my uh, memory, I think he's the first one that have uh, come from the from Virgil uh, uh, students. So congratulations, Stacy. Stacy is now living in Clarenville uh, with his family. And I also want to uh, congratulate Craig Young. Of course, you all know who Craig Young is. He's, uh, uh, he's the son of Henry Young. And for the past four years, Craig has won the best guitarist for country music in all of Canada. And that award uh, was given by his peers, and he has won that for the past four years. So I just thought I'd mention these uh, two people because uh, they certainly deserve mentioning for the wonderful work that uh, they uh, have achieved. So Merry Christmas to you all and a Happy New Year. On Thursday of this week, our MHA Calvin Parsons stopped by the studio for an interview. Good day. Uh, it's a great pleasure as uh, MHA for this district, Calvin Parsons here, to uh, make a presentation at this time to uh, Chief Glenn Han of the Virgil Fire Department and to Bruce Green. We were down to the uh, ceremonies, of course, at their uh, annual Fireman's Ball earlier, but these gentlemen, for work commitments uh, reasons, weren't available. But uh, this is indeed a, a great uh, honor, and I'd like to take this opportunity to do it uh, uh, with special thanks, of course, to the Virgil Broadcasting System for allowing us to uh, avail of their uh, facilities to do this. This is the Firefighting Long Service Bar that's being presented to both gentlemen in recognition and appreciation of 25 years of loyal and dedicated firefighting service to the protection of life and property throughout our province. 
and the plaque is signed by Mr. Jack Byrne, Minister of Municipal and Provincial Affairs, and Premier Danny William. And I've been asked on behalf of government to make these presentation to these gentlemen of these certificates and the bar, which they, of course, will wear on their uniform in the future, signifying this 25 years of dedicated service. So, gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to present you with your bar and your certificate in recognition of this long service. Thank you very much. Bruce, thank you, very much. Thank you gentlemen. And uh, in the keeping with the season as well, I'd like to wish both of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you and your families as well. Thank you. Thank you. Send you and your family and grandchildren and children a Merry Christmas Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Here with us in our studio are MHA Calvin Parsons. Welcome again, Mr. Parsons. Good morning. Good to be back again. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's uh, the house just closed a few days ago, so I was trying to do a few Christmas things and got down last evening to your award ceremony at school again. I think this is the seventh year now that I've been down at the awards. Uh, the groups are getting smaller. Yes. There seems to be less and less kids, of course, and uh, and less and less parents. But part of that is due, no doubt, to the out migration, but yes. also the declining birth rate. It's yep. pretty obvious that there's not as many kids now as there used to be in the in the system. And I noticed from your reaction when they were passing out the uh, awards and the, and the monetary uh, certificates that they continue to impress you. Overly impressed. <laughs> uh, I mean, the marks that come out of the kids down here is just unreal, and I find. Uh, a lot of times, a, a kid may be good in a certain area, for example, maybe in social studies or in the sciences or mathematics, but uh, last evening, it seemed like everybody who was getting awards, they're so well-rounded and balanced that they were at top marks in, whether it be history or geography or religion or science or biology, and I just can't believe there was a couple of people there last night at an average of 100. Yeah. Now, I mean, I figured that's pretty good. You can't get much better than averaging 100. And lots of, of course, 97s and 98s and stuff. And, and I mean, on a provincial scale, that is, that is just amazing. It it's, is. It's amazing. It is, yeah. Our kids do uh, do very well in, in all the uh, criteria that the CRTs and the other tests that they write that, you know, the school is very, very pleased. On average, I think most of them, um, they do better than the provincial average. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, and it's quite obvious, and yeah. uh, like we see a lot of this throughout the province in terms yeah. of awards and presentations. But yeah, it leaves leaves me shaking my head every time I come here. Yeah. I just, when you hear the numbers yeah. of how many students there are and how well they do, it's just yeah. amazing. It so, says a lot for the teachers too. It, it uh, certainly does, and and the kids themselves, and and the parents, and and like as like working together, like you know, it, it gives our children the advantage that when they go out into the wider world then they're more prepared than what they would be if we didn't work as hard. That's right. Yeah. And we, we were discussing earlier about the internet and stuff. Uh, yeah. Nowadays they're out into the world before they even go out into yes. the world because yes. they're, they're online most of them now from the time they're kids yeah. and there's no such thing now as going away from home to experience something. They usually get all the experience you want on the internet now, nowadays yeah. and they know what kind of world awaits them. Yeah. But regardless of where you go, you still need that education. You still need that and, education, uh, yeah. It's been proven that those who get it are far better off than those who don't have it. That's exactly right. So uh, yeah. they'll do quite well. And I was personally pleased that uh, George Reed, Mayor Reed, mentioned last night that Burjo had its first lawyer, which is a soft spot with me, of course, because of course. Uh, being a lawyer myself, and, and I was the first lawyer to come out of Port of Basque who was born there and, and raised there and to practice there and have two sons do the same thing. And now last night to hear that there's a lawyer who came out of Burgio, you would had a doctor before this. Doctor before, yeah. And it just goes to show that no matter where you're born yeah. or where you're raised in this province, that the opportunities are there and everybody's got equal opportunity to be whatever they want to be. And yeah. that was, I was very pleased to hear that last night. Yeah, it, was, it was a very, it was a very uh, heartwarming story. Yeah, because yeah, especially when, when you know the kids, right? Yes. You know who they yes. are. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's the other thing I, yeah. <clears throat> I noticed after seven years, the kids were, were getting their awards last night. When I first saw them, they were just in grade, some of them weren't even on the stage because right. they weren't even to grade seven. But, uh, yeah. but you see them come all the way up through, and they consistently do well. It doesn't seem to be just one year. They, they seem to be the same students each year who are dedicated and, uh, and yeah. take the top honors. Yeah, we have a great, uh, we have a great school over there for sure. Um, so what's been up with uh, Mr. Parsons since our last visit? Well, we had, a, we had a busy, busy House of Assembly again this time. We, uh, <coughs> we were in session for about four weeks, which is pretty average for the, the Christmas break. Uh, normally you go right up to the 20th, 21st. 
but they actually worked a couple of late nights. So we were there a couple of mornings till one, two o'clock in the morning and did it. The session in the fall is called the legislative session. That's where you pass any new laws that you have and get that stuff done or amend any laws that you want to amend. And in the spring, that's called the budgetary session where you deal with the budgets for the year and what's good and bad about the budgets. So there was a few things. There was nothing really, really significant. It looks like the house will reopen again now in January probably because the raw material sharing system, which they brought in the fishery last year and which they scrapped, uh, they turned it over to Richard Cashin for an arbitration, and he ruled just last week, and he's recommended another system, and there needs to be some legislative changes in order to bring his system in, and in order to have it in place so that the fishermen, uh, not so much on this coast, but on the northeast coast of Newfoundland, the, the crab industry, of yes. course, is very, very big in the shellfish industry, they need it in place by April at least. So rather than wait till March when the house normally would open, I think we're going to go back again in January and, and do that piece. So that'll be well set up before the season starts. Okay. Um, there's a, <coughs> a couple of things that like, we look at through the government website. And I was just wondering, uh, out of curiosity, um, this is the um, pre-budget uh, consultations wrap up. Now, like, do you have, what do you, uh, the opposition have in terms of that process? We can take part in the process. Normally what, what's involved there is the Minister of Finance and his officials would go around certain areas of the province and any communities or individuals or associations who want to make some input into the system to say we think you ought to put some money here or you ought not to do such and such. Uh, that gives you an opportunity so that the Minister of Finance can hear those concerns and comments and suggestions before he puts the finishing touches on his budget. It will probably be finalized around the end of January. So he takes that time in the fall to listen to people and any final tinkering that he has to do, that's, that's when he'll do it is in January month. And then of course the budget usually comes out in February or early March. And then it gets debated in the House and that normally takes two or three months to get passed. Okay. He's probably, no doubt, they got their plan as to what the big, the big plan is going to be. So these consultations are more along the lines of, of smaller considerations that they usually know what they're going to do with most of their money and in Newfoundland Labrador most of the money is already pre-committed in the mm -hmm. sense that you know what it costs every year for your education you know what it costs for social services you know what it costs for health care you know what it costs for your public sector workers and so on so once you get that out of the way there's very little in Newfoundland left to deal with the question is now of what we do have left where are our priorities going to be is it going to be in new schools will it be in uh, new municipal infrastructure, will it be in highways, and so on. And that's, that's where he has to make those final decisions. Okay. The other uh, topic that seemed uh, to be getting a lot, not quite a lot, I guess, but uh, through the open line, of course, you, you, you listen to that yourself, and this is the Sunday hunting. I was just curious to know that if you had gotten any calls from uh, our district about pro for against the Sunday hadn't, hunting? I hadn't heard a thing about it in two years. This, mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, and uh, we heard about it earlier. There was people, different groups that seemed to be, some were advocating for, some were advocating against. The thing seems to have died, and then all of a sudden, uh, out of the blue, we are told that a portion of the season now was going to be permit hunting, I believe, after October. Uh, don't know where it came from, don't know who was pushing the agenda, has been done. Uh, Got no particular feelings one way or the other as to whether it's good or bad. Uh, I guess you can, you know, personally, uh, I'm not a hunter anymore. I used to be, but I don't hunt myself, so I don't have any personal interest in whether it's one way or the other. But uh, if it's a happy medium for everybody, well, that, that's fine. And I guess we'll see down the road if it worked or didn't work. It's like Sunday shopping. Uh, sure. We had strong opinions one way and the other on Sunday shopping, but nowadays it doesn't seem to be much of an issue anymore. People take it for granted and and it goes on. Um, the other uh, topic um, that somebody mentioned to me was the um, oil rebates. It seemed to be taking, uh, uh, I don't know if longer than normal or whatever, but some people I guess are just wondering when when that is going to kick in. Yes, it is longer than normal. The process, I believe, is flawed. We've told the Minister of Finance is flawed. Uh, there's no reason, really, that, my understanding is there's no checks cut yet uh, no, that, to I think, anybody, yeah. and they're expecting to get them now shortly, they say, but they've been telling you for the last month shortly, 
And this is not a first time thing where you need to be bogged down in this. They've gone through this before. All they've done basically is increase the amount that you're getting over what the program used to be yeah. by a little bit. They haven't changed the program that the, the Liberal government brought in two or three years ago. All they've done is change the amount. So it shouldn't be rocket science to figure out how to get it right and what you're looking for. The criteria haven't changed, but yet we got this bogged down in the Department of Finance. And I wouldn't be surprised that part of it is due to the layoffs. Like we are in many areas of government when it comes to employees short-staffed. So okay. when you take a program like this that might have ran before fairly easily because you had the workers to do it and all of a sudden you're trying to do the same thing with less workers you run into these problems. Mm. You just can't produce the same amount of work if you don't have the people there to do it. Well. That's about all I had to ask. We're glad you're here. If you'd like to have anything else you'd like to have. Uh, just to say, I've been very pleased so far with a uh, few little things happening, you know, on the scenes with the, the mayor and the council, and uh, they've been involved and had some preliminary meetings and so on. And uh, uh, I guess at this point, the only thing one can say is you never give up hope that, that something might happen in the wind. Uh, I see here now a lot of people go away. They, it seems to become pretty uh, commonplace that that certainly the men uh, mm. go away and, and uh, seismic work or, or working at fish plants in other areas and so on. And uh, I'm sure they'd all like to be staying home and making the same amount of money. Uh, I'm not sure even if there were any kind of industry here that you could make the money that you're making in, uh, in other places, particularly Western Canada. And uh, some, some of the people that I've talked to, they, not that they're contented to go away, and of course everybody would love to be able to stay home with their families and have the standard of living that they want to enjoy. But I guess there's a recognition now that in order to get that standard of living, there's nowhere in Newfoundland virtually that you can get that standard of living. So it's sort of, we like the opportunity that that offers as well, that the money that it offers and the standard of living that it gives us. It's just unfortunate that we can't do it here in our own backyard rather than doing it in somebody else's backyard. And, uh, and it's unfortunate in the sense that families don't get to spend the time together. If mom or dad got to go away, that's not the ideal family situation to have. So uh, if we could have it here, it would be much better. And even if mom here, if mom was the one who stayed home, had something to do. So uh, I'm hoping in the future that if there was some kind of little core business or industry that you could have, that people who were here could do something if they want it to do. Uh, that it's here and available to them. So, uh, so we haven't given up hope on that. That's that's still in the works as well. And God knows what the new year might bring. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, thanks so much for dropping by. Thank you, and I'd like to take this opportunity to wish yourself and yours and everybody in the town of Birdshill uh, happy, uh, merry Christmas, and a very happy new year. And I hope you have a safe and prosperous new year as well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We have with us in our studio today our MP, Bill Matthews. Welcome, Mr. Matthews. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Good. Well, it's good to have you. Uh, so what are you doing in town? Well, of course, I've been uh, working my way through the riding since we do have a federal election coming on January 23rd. So uh, it just so happened that uh, I did a number of communities on the coast yesterday and arrived in Virgil just before dark. And it so happened that it coincided with the awards night at Virgil Academy, which was I guess good timing, so I was able to go there and uh, take in that event and see the students and parents and uh, all their supporters and uh, just delighted to be here for that event and spend some time in Bergio. Okay, so what have you been up to in the last little while? It's been a while since we chatted, so well, what have you, you know, been doing? Well, of course, up, to, up prior to the, the House of Commons dissolving, Parliament dissolving, I spent a lot of time in Ottawa with the minority government situation. We, As members, we were required to be in Ottawa pretty regularly. It didn't give you a lot of time to be away from Ottawa, but I, most weekends I, I got away Friday uh, to the riding somewhere on the weekend and went back usually Sunday evening, but uh, it pretty much meant you were tied to Ottawa throughout the week. In a majority parliament things would be different, you know, because you'd have more flexibility with numbers, but you know, we were constantly under the threat of defeat by the opposition parties, and so you had to be there. So between that and traveling just about every weekend to somewhere in the riding, it was a pretty hectic schedule for a number of months. 
Okay. And look, you, you stated before that you were, you're now into the election mode. I think right now the parties has decided to, uh, to have a stay for, for election things, and it's really almost unfair of us to uh, ask you election questions. But I'm sure throughout the writing that you're getting bombarded with questions about the Liberals and what they're doing or what they're not doing. What seems to be most of the concerns um, for uh, this writing? I'm assuming along the coast is probably the fisheries. And what is yeah. the Liberal Party? Uh, fisheries issues are, you know, are fairly important, you know, but, but having said that, you know, in a significant portion of the writing, we, we have a pretty good fishery, particularly down in the 3PS region. And, uh, you know, where we do have still cod fishery, we've had to maintain a commercial cod fishery there, some 15,000 metric tons. And we have a good lobster fishery. And we have, well, this year the crab fishery turned into a real mess, as we know, all over the province. Hopefully, with the cashing report, that will be better next year. So down in that section of the riding, there's, there's a very good fishery. Uh, you know, on the southwest coast, the southwest corner, of course, we're back into our second year of a commercial golf cod fishery. We had a shutdown for a couple of years. So that's making its way back. That stock is regenerating. So, you know, the fishery on the south and southwest coast is, is probably the best place it is in the province. So that's pretty good, but what we find on the coast, or what I'm finding in most of our communities, you know, is concerns about health care, especially in the isolated communities where they only get a visit from a doctor or a nurse, you know, sometimes, like yesterday, I was in one or two communities where the first time they saw the nurse for three weeks. Well, that's a long time if you've mm -hmm. got a medical problem. So that's an issue. And, uh, and then the out-migration, you know, I mean, it's amazing yesterday in the <coughs> communities that I visited that the number of men that have gone away or are going away to work on seismic mm -hmm. and in communities that I never heard that before. So, you know, so the, as I travel the coast, you know, which I've done now for about eight years as a member of parliament, like I noticed the, uh, I guess the, the few number of young people left in the towns and the aging population. So that's a major problem on this coast. And, uh, you know, because that, of course, what it means is there's a smaller tax base for, for municipal governments who are expected to offer services to the residents. So that's one of the major problems we have on this, I guess not only this coast, but I think really in rural Newfoundland. Rural Newfoundland is going to a, a tremendously hard time. I mean, you just listen to the news of the last few months with your Harbor Bretons and your Fortunes and your Stephenvilles and, and on and on it goes, you know, and with the, the expected uh, FBI operational review, I expect there's going to be more <laughs> communities in this province that's going to get more bad news when they release that report. So it's not good in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a real challenge. So what, what uh, do you see for the Liberal Party as in helping these communities to survive and to, uh, to be viable? Well, we're, you know, I, I say so many times when I'm traveling, like if it wasn't for our federal programs and our infusion of funds through, you know, what was Human Resources uh, Development Canada and now it's Services Canada, and through the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, you know, I mean, we put so much money into those rural communities through those, through those two particular agencies that if that wasn't there, you know, life would be a lot rougher and a lot worse in those communities. But, you know, what, and it's so difficult to find a core industry for a lot of our communities, like right here in Bergio. I mean, we've been so many years trying to find that core industry for Bergio, which we need, because from a core industry, we'll, we'll spin off other small businesses and other other economic uh, opportunities, but it's finding the resource, and you know it's been a tremendous struggle here. We're going through the same struggle right now for Harbour Breton, and my expectations are that we're headed for the same plight in Fortune. And who knows with the FBI review that's coming, you know I'm expecting Marystown will be impacted negatively. So that's just in this writing, uh, not counting the other FBI operations in other parts of the province. So it's it's one hectic challenge, uh, but resource is the problem. You know, I'm still hoping that, uh, you know, we can find a solution for Burgio. I mean, there's been some, I guess, commentary as of late about, you know, some potential with, you know, looking at a South Coast strategy. I mean, I've had preliminary discussions with Premier Williams on it over the last number of months, uh, looking at trying to do something in a no number of communities on the South Coast, you know. And uh, I'm still hopeful that if we all work together that we might be able to, to do that. But, uh, you know, with the communities and the provincial government and the federal government, I'm hoping that we still be able to find a solution for a number of our communities. It won't be for every community because that's impossible. So I, I'm still hoping that somewhere in this mix, you know, there will be a solution for Burgio and Harbour Breton. Do you believe, um, some folks believe, I should say, that the government is, I'll say, for lack of a better term, secretly trying to relocate uh, areas like Burgio and and uh, Ramia and Fortunes and, and the Mary's Towns and the Harbour Bretons and trying to get those people to uh, move out of those areas because of 
the lack of resources and whatnot and move them into bigger areas. Do you believe that that is so? Well, I, I hear that, you know, I hear that in my travels and in my work as a member of parliament, but, you know, I, I, I find <coughs> it hard to believe that any government would be sort of silently deliberate about that happening. I mean, I can only tell you from a, a federal perspective and as your member of parliament that, you know, I, I work with the communities and I work with the provincial government, and both former and present, to try and find solutions. Uh, but the biggest problem we have in most of our communities is finding a resource to, to put people back to work. Uh, that's the constant struggle, and that's what we're still dealing with now. I mean, if we can somehow, between all levels of government, uh, develop a strategy for two or three communities on this coast, and one of them includes Virgil, uh, you know, I, you know that, that would be great. And, I, you know, I, I'm still somewhat optimistic that we can do that. Uh, but, you know, that's going to take a, a, an operator uh, with, a, I guess, a ingenuity, and as well with, uh, with good financial backing, because, you know, uh, in order to, to go into new initiatives in, in, in fish or any other business, I mean, you, you need deep pockets. Uh, you know, governments can help, but the day of governments completely paying the bills, you know, that it usually doesn't work. If that's the requirement, that the only way you can start a business in a community is if the government totally funds it, you know, unless the operator uh, has some financial obligations and commitment to it, you know, usually it doesn't work. So I'm hoping that, that between us all we can find a solution for two or three of our communities. I mean, there are things that are being talked about sort of on a preliminary basis, and I'm just hoping that in the new year we'll all be able to, to get together and hopefully work some of this out. And I'm hoping that we'll see something here in Burgio that we can that we can call, you know, a core industry because you need that. I mean, I know a lot of your people are going away to work and coming back. Uh, you know, that's not what people desire. Some people may choose to stay at that, but certainly there's a core of people here in this, this community that are either here or going away and working and coming back that would prefer to, to work right here. So I'm hoping, you know, that we can find that. I mean, we've been at it for a long time, but, but I remain optimistic. I mean, you know, I'm not one of those who, who <coughs> quit and, and say it's over kind of thing. I, I try to keep working for a solution. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon all levels of government to work together at the municipal, provincial, federal levels to try and find solutions. Uh, because without that, you know, uh, what will happen over time is, is what you described earlier. I mean, you know, more and more people would leave, population shrinks, the tax base for the municipality shrinks and gets smaller, and then you're not able to offer the services that, that people so, so readily require. And what, what we're finding, of course, is that, you know, the people who need the services most uh, are aging. And uh, that's, it's a bit of a challenge, I can tell you. As, you know, and, and when you're out in a boat as much as I am, to out the riding, you, you've noticed it. Um, on another note, now, we've... Um it seems people are feeling that they're not as able to um, contact, access your phone numbers uh, as they they should be or they feel they should be. Um, w before you leave this morning, would you be able to give us some numbers where we can, you know, easily contact you? Oh. You do have a office set up here in the writing, I'm assuming. Oh, we have two, actually. Yes. We, have, we have one in Stephenville and one in Marystown. And uh, we have a toll-free line that goes into Stephenville. I'm interested, I'm interested in your comment on that because I, 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 didn't, I wasn't aware of that, that people are having difficulty getting through. Yes. Uh, no, but we, what we do, uh, Parliament provides every member of Parliament with, with one toll-free line. I could have that in Ottawa or I can have it somewhere in the province. Of course, I chose to have it in the writing. So that toll-free number goes into Stephenville. And, uh, you know, I have an, uh, an assistant in Stephenville there. And, uh, but I'm interested to hear what you've said about that because I'll certainly inquire about that because there should be no... No problem. I mean, the reason for the toll-free line is that members, you know, peop members of the public can, can call their member of parliament at no, no cost. Okay. I mean, if you call my office on the Beeren Peninsula directly, well, there's a long distance charge associated with that. But the, the, the 1888 number that goes into Stephenville is toll-free. Okay. So, so that's the system. Every member of parliament in Canada is provided with that service. Now, some members of parliament don't have constituency offices. They, they just have the number coming into Ottawa. I chose to have it in the riding because I thought that was the best place to have it, you know, for obvious okay. reasons. Yeah. So I do have an office in Stephenville, one in Grand Bank, the Bear oh. Peninsula. So. Are they manned, uh, you know, throughout the week? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have full-time employees in both places. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. That was very so, interesting then. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Well, before you leave, you can probably give us yes, uh, I, I give can. us the numbers to make sure, sure that we do have them properly recorded. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Recorded. I, I'm interested to hear you say that because that's yeah. something, you know, I, I, I've i always been one that, that wants the, the people I represent to have access to me. And, it, yes. you know, regardless of time, day or night, yes. when I was with you, I mean. It's not uncommon for me to get calls at home, you know, at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. You don't really appreciate them, but you get them, you know, <laughs> and this business is going to happen. Uh, but, no, that's the system we have, you know. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, just that it's a pleasure to be here. I was truly delighted to be at school last night with the bright young students and their parents and their teachers. And it was very well organized. I, I was telling someone after how impressed I was with the, how well organized the event was and how smoothly it ran. 
and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I just want to take this opportunity to wish you and uh, all your viewers a very Merry Christmas and a prosperous Happy New Year. Well, thanks so much for dropping by. My pleasure. On Thursday of this week, the snack program once again served breakfast to the students and staff of Virgil Academy. What a perfect way to start the last day of school before Christmas holidays with breakfast at school. The breakfast started at 8 a.m. in the Ohm Ek Room of Virgil Academy and ran until 8.45. The snack program volunteers made and served the breakfast for all who attended. There was a wide variety of food to choose from so everyone could enjoy their favorites from the group. Breakfast included pancakes, French toast, fresh fruit along with milk or juice to quench your thirst. There was a great turnout for the function and breakfast was wonderful. Thanks go out to the snack program volunteers once again for helping with another successful event. Thursday morning, the 2-3 class out of sing-along. After recess, the high school students hosted their annual Christmas talent show. Here are a few highlights from both. Both these will be shown in their entirety after the second part of this year in review on January the 8th. Seven seas that run 
On Thursday night, the Lions Club and the Lioness Club held a pub night for the residents of the Calder Health Care Centre. About this time each year, the Burgeal Lions and Lioness try to bring a little Christmas cheer to the residents at the Calder Health Care Centre with a pub night. This event also helps the Lions and Lioness to live out their motto, We serve and we serve too. There were plenty of musicians on end to provide the music. There was also plenty of snacks and sweets to enjoy, as well as refreshments. The lions danced with the residents who were able to dance. The residents seemed to enjoy the evening, and this is only the beginning. There are many more activities planned throughout the Christmas season. Stay with us for the BBS Playbill, all after this. Before setting it up, saw two inches diagonal off the butt. Keep it stored in a water-based container. The cooler the room, the longer the tree will stay fresh. Don't block door or window, which might be used to escape. When using candles, make sure that they are in the proper holder so they can't fall over and never leave them unattended. A home smoke detector and an all-purpose dry chemical fire extinguisher make an excellent Christmas gift. Have a safe and fire-free holiday. BBS Playbill. Tune in on Tuesday on Channel 43 at 7.30 p.m. for the Anglican Church Carol Service. On Thursday, we will have the Faith United Church Children's Program on Channel 43 at 7.30 p.m. And I'll be here again next week with the first part of the year in review. For this week in review, I'm Marie Rose. Good night and God bless. And may you and yours have a very merry Christmas and a happy, prosperous New Year.